And our final speaker is Valerie Evner. Um, Valerie is going to be speaking about the key ecological principles to guide adaptive management of grassland weeds under variable conditions. Valerie, whenever you are ready. Great. Thank you. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much first to uh, Gail and Whitney for organizing such a great um, session. I'm sorry I missed uh, some of it uh, earlier. I was previous engagements, but uh, really great uh, to be here. And I just want to acknowledge that the work I'm talking about uh, today is in collaboration with lots of different folks. And so Chris had talked about right, annual grasses in general. And what I'm going to talk about uh, now is some of our later season um, noxious weeds. So things like Medusa head and goat grass, uh, as well as yellow star thistle. So these are later season um, species that essentially can create these monocultures. You can see, right, very little else other than yellow star thistle here and goat grass and Medusa head up here. And uh, these are a huge concern for uh, biodiversity. They're also a big concern for livestock productivity. Uh, livestock productivity can decrease 50 to 75% when we get these monoculture invasions um, of these species, both because the forage quality is poor, but also because uh, the forage is, uh, amount is a lot lower. And right, I mentioned these are later uh, season. It's very typical. This is uh, what you see in the grasslands now around uh, May, which is right, our California gold or typical oats and bromes uh, have senesced, but we see these later season invasive species uh, still active in green. And just to give this a little right, cartoon uh, version, because we'll be looking at this cartoon a lot uh, throughout this talk, is uh, essentially our, uh, they're exotic, you know, annual grasses, but they're the ones that have been around for a few hundred years, right? Our oats and our bromes, and um, it's, they cover about 95% of our grasslands and are a little tough to fully um, get rid of. And so, right, for those with the first uh, germinating rains, they start growing, grow pretty steadily through the season. And somewhere around April, um, they start flowering and producing seeds. And uh, usually by early to mid-May, they've senesced. Uh, when we look at these later season uh, invasives, the goat grass, medusa head, and things like yellow star thistle, uh, they also germinate with those first rains, but they don't grow very much um, until later in the spring. So they just start to grow when the oats and the bromes and the other sort of dominant annuals are starting to kick out. And they have this key period where um, they are active after those other species uh, have senesced. And so folks have used this a lot as uh, a tool for when might be good to come in and do management. And we're going to talk about that in the second half of the talk, but we're also going to talk about this as uh, helping to understand why these may have become such a problem um, over the last 50 years or so. Uh, and essentially thinking about, right, are, is this new wave of invaders um, an issue because of changing environmental conditions? And so because they're late, uh, active later in the season. The first thing we obviously think about is rainfall. And of course, right, the last 10 years or so, we've been mostly um, drought. But if we think about when these have become, um, right, an issue, basically like from the 1940s um, on, we have been seeing um, more late season uh, rainfall. And so uh, this upper graph is looking at uh, El Nino, which is in red on top versus La Nina uh, conditions. And essentially, right, the zero line is the quote unquote normal. And you can see there really aren't any normal um, years. And then um, the departure from normal. And so in red, is uh, the departures that are more towards El Nino conditions. So um, wetter conditions in um, blue is the La Nina or the drier conditions. And what you can see when you compare, right, like 1950s, 1960s, 1970s to th uh, the last few decades is a lot more El Nino events, right? Longer, so right, wider bars. And when we look at the departure from normal, a lot higher. Um, Again, last 10 years, slightly different um, uh, story because we've mostly been uh, in drought. But we're th when we're thinking about the trajectory of these um, weeds, there has been more later season uh, rainfall. If we look more locally at some of our Northern California weather stations, 
um, here we see uh, average precipitation uh, by month in the dark blue is looking 1916 to 45 in the pink is 1946 to 75 and in like the aqua color is uh, 1976 to 2005 and so what you can see from these is uh, essentially the last uh, half century we've been having more rainfall more winter rainfall but also more it's not a lot but more rainfall right in the late spring and uh, to see if this influences uh, prevalence of these um, noxious late season weeds, we actually did a trial where um, over the course of six years, we had plots where we didn't manipulate rainfall at all, plots that we made about 25% drier, plots that we made 25% wetter right through the whole growing season. Um, and then we also, those wetter plots, we also extended the growing season by just two weeks, right? We just gave it two more weeks of rainfall. Then this late wet treatment um, did not change any of the rainfall through the season, but we just added an extra two weeks of rainfall at the end of the growing season. And what you can see, both that wet, which again, got two weeks extended season and the late wet have the same increase in goat grass and Medusa head compared to the control um, and dry, right? Essentially a doubling of uh, their cover under these later wet conditions. When we think about trajectories over time, uh, this is looking at percent cover of goat grass and Medusa head in the Central Valley um, at some of our sites uh, from 2008 to uh, 2017. And right, you can see, it's a roller coaster. Uh, the wet years, uh, this was a particularly wet year, have very high amounts of Medusa head and goat grass, right? In the drought, they plummeted. Um, but then post drought, uh, we see a big increase again. Uh, uh, that, that happens pretty quickly uh, post drought as soon as there's some rain. And what we've been finding is that the control. Um, processes we use, whether it's grazing or prescribed fire or mowing or some herbicide. Um, when we're at these peak populations in those high rainfall years, it's very difficult to control um, these weeds. Even when you can get control, there's enough moisture in the soil that we get some recovery and some seeding. It might just be a little you know, two inch goat grass that's getting a you know, little head of seed out, but they are remarkably persistent in recovering if there's any moisture in the soil at all. So this then leads to these dry years, right? Not only do we have population crashes, so we have less to control, but there's less recovery post-treatment because there's no moisture left in the soil for them uh, to recover. And so one of the take-homes of this is really take advantage of, right, there's Little we can say that's good about drought years, but one of the good things is, right, those are good years to come in and really try to decrease um, our Medusa head and goat grass populations because you can see um, that even though we have low amounts, um, say in this 2014 drought year, it increases pretty quickly once there's a little bit of rainfall. One other global change factor that I want to talk about is nitrogen deposition. Uh, so this is essentially uh, pollution in the atmosphere um, that fertilizes places um, uh, downwind where that polluted air lands. And this is uh, this nitrogen pollution is from right, fossil fuel emissions. It's from agricultural um, emissions. And Stu Weiss has been a champion of uh, the importance of nitrogen deposition in our grasslands for decades now. And he has this great graphic um, showing that 50% of our grasslands are exposed to an ecologically significant amount of uh, this nitrogen pollution um, each year. And that this actually has devastating effects on um, uh, native diversity, especially for our wildflowers. And uh, it increases uh, invasive species. And so um, here on the right uh, in this graph, we've 
looked at plots again in the Central Valley where we either left them alone, which is in red, or we gave them um, fertilizer and the amount that Stu had showed was really important, that five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, right, which is 50% of our grasslands are getting it. And we got about a 30% increase in cover of um, our invasive weeds. And this is really important to think about because, right, climate change and our precipitation patterns uh, changing, this is Right, this is global in scope and it's very hard for us as a state to do concrete things um, on our own with that. But nitrogen deposition is very much a regional issue, right? It, um, it comes from local sources, right? And travels, you know, on the, the, the scale that we're thinking here, right? Travels like maybe 50 to 100, you know, miles is where most is where most of our deposition um, is. And so this is something that we can actually do like regional and state um, changes in policy uh, to decrease. And this can be really important, not just for the invasive weeds, but again, there's a lot of implications in terms of our diversity, especially of our wildflowers um, and some indication that uh, this fertilization may be actually wiping out some of our key species that are really important in drought response. So when we're thinking back to just these late season noxious um, weeds, a key question is how do we control um, these, especially under these variable conditions? And so we're gonna go back to our little cartoon of when different species um, are active. And what you can see uh, is I mentioned like this part here and I'm realizing I don't think you can see my arrows, um, but this little, uh, part of the spring here where the exotic grasses that have been dominant for hundreds of years are senesced, but our goat grass and Medusa head and also yellow star thistle are still active, does give us a nice little window of time um, to decrease those before they're producing seeds. And so there's been a lot of great work by Emilio Laca and others um, doing very targeted grazing, right? Um, at flowering or before flowering, um, and found that this can be really successful in decreasing um, the prevalence of goat grass and Medusa head uh, for the next year, especially in those dry years where um, they can't recover post grazing in terms of putting out seeds. What's difficult about this though, is sometimes that window of when to hit it is really short. Like sometimes it's 10 days. Um, and it's also super variable across the landscape, um, right? There'll be north facing slopes where the key window will be later. There's south facing slopes where it's sooner. And so it's very hard to do sort of broad landscape uh, control uh, with this. So very important, but has to be pretty targeted uh, both in time and in the space that you're focused on. What's of a little bit more concern is thinking about when most of our grazing um, winds up happening in our grasslands. And so not surprisingly, right, peak grazing is going to be at peak green biomass of our forage. Um, so March, April, uh, into early May usually. And what we're finding is that Grazing at this time, which, right, if you're a producer, you have to be grazing at this time. This is when you've got, right, the most forage on the land and um, often in lower elevation California grasslands, at least, you know, um, right after this point, cattle are taken um, off the land and shipped um, elsewhere uh, to more productive uh, pastures for the summer. And so what are the impacts of this peak season grazing? And so this is work that um, I've done with Carolyn Malmstrom and Kevin Rice and Andy Dyer. And essentially what um, we're finding is that when you've got all of that right, great biomass of the uh, oats and the bromes and you graze it, what happens? You don't have all of that massive amount of green biomass, which means they're not sucking up water from the soil. And that essentially means there's lots of water sitting in the soil for these late season exotic species. Um, so this is looking at how much water goat grass and Medusa head are using um, in the hatch bar is when we've um, uh, mowed in the spring and the white bar is when we haven't. And you can see right more than double the water use um, of goat grass and Medusa head when you have right that spring clipping. And we've also done this on um, graze sites, but the data are a little messier to show. Um, right. So you're leaving all of that water um, in the soil. They're going to take advantage of it. 
What happens in terms of seeds? Um, on the left here is goat grass seed. On the right is Medusa head seed. And um, again, white is no clipped um, and the hatch is clipped. And you can see right, goat grass about quadruples its seed production uh, when we've removed Avena and Bromus because of that extra water in the soil. And uh, Medusa heads about doubles its seed production. What does this mean for the next year's um, percent cover? We see about a 30% increase in um, plant biomass of these noxious grass um, seeds the following year, again, because there's so much more seed production. So this leads to right one of the limits to thinking about these exotic grasses coming into um, other right long term longer term exotic uh, annual grasses is there's just nobody to compete with them in this later season um, time and this is when our native uh, perennial grasses uh, come in so uh, when you've got your first growing season of native um, grasses, they look very similar to the goat grass and the medusa head here in the center, but once they're established um, right they're greening up very quickly in the fall, have a lot of biomass on them already, stay green um, through uh, late spring, and so they can provide some direct competition. So what does this mean in terms of uh, actual suppression of goat grass and medusa head? So you saw this graph before looking at goat grass uh, and medusa head uh, cover as it varies year to year. And this is when it's um, growing with things like uh, wild oats and bromes. When we have uh, neighboring plots that we've done native restoration in, uh, and the restoration started in uh, 2008, so uh, the first year in this graph. And so goat grass and Medusa head cover in blue is when they're growing with uh, native perennials. In green, it's when they're uh, with the exotic annuals like the oats and the bromes. And what you can see, not surprisingly, right, those first couple of years when the natives are establishing, go across the Medusa head are going crazy and are dominating. But as those natives establish, we're seeing lower and lower amounts of Medusa head and uh, goat grass. And right, that big rainy year, we're seeing a lot less. There's a little bit of a blip up, but right, it's a lot. Uh, less, it's a lot more suppressed than it is in the annual grassland. We see the same decrease uh, in response to drought, but post drought, um, right in the green, we're seeing, oh yeah, when goat grass and Medusa head are with the other annual grasses, it skyrockets post drought versus with the native perennials. Uh, we found that they were actually slowly increasing in cover during the drought. And so recovery of Medusa head and goat grass is super, um, muted uh, when they're grown with the native perennial. So this is really good news in terms of right, a long-term suppression uh, strategy. Another aspect with um, timing and phenology is burns, which um, Chris had just talked about uh, earlier. And what we often find is when we're doing prescribed burns, particularly for noxious weed control, we're doing them at this time of the season in the purple box, right? The idea is that uh, there's enough senesced um, medusa head, sorry, med uh, oats and bromes and things like that to carry a fire and hopefully kill uh, the medusa head and goat grass um, before uh, their seeds are produced in fall. Flip side of that is our wildfires, right? These tend to happen a little bit later in the summer and the fall when the seeds are already um, fallen and on the ground. And um, so the thought was in prescribed fire was often this was the key time to hit it. But we're what we're finding with wildfires is most of the annual grass seed essentially falls into the thatch. And so as that thatch goes up, so does a lot of um, uh, the seeds from that previous uh, growing season. And uh, Edie Allen and colleagues had found that overall uh, seed germination decreases uh, 70 fold in response to wildfires, but for the dominant grasses, it decreases 50 fold. So we took a look at this at uh, in the Mendocino fire in uh, Hopland Research Extension Center, where uh, there were adjacent burned and unburned um, areas by the fire. And then there was also a month before the fire, they had done a series of prescribed uh, fires, uh, giving us direct ability to compare those. And so uh, 
on this graph, we're having the number of uh, seedlings that emerge from uh, the seed bank. Uh, here under unburned conditions, in the middle is prescribed conditions, uh, burned conditions, and on the right is wildfire conditions. And in black is goat grass, in red is Medusa head. Uh, and so what you can see, if we'll first just look at Medusa head in red, um, lots in the unburned, almost eliminated in prescribed fires and wildfires. Uh, goat grass in black, same sort of pattern. There's definitely more. It's not, you know, it's not eliminated. It's not as much as we'd like, but there's still um, very good decrease in the amount of seedlings uh, that emerge. When we look at what that means in terms of percent cover um, of the plants, that's here on the right. Um, so at the end of that first growing season after fire, um, for Medusa head again in red, we see percent cover again is almost eliminated uh, post fire. So both seed survival and percent cover are decreased by about 98%. For goat grass, right, we got a big decrease in seed survival, but we only have a more modest decrease in percent uh, cover. So about 37% decrease in cover with prescribed fire and about 67% with wildfire. So this certainly gives us, right, just like post drought, it gives us an opportunity to get in there and um, hit it while it's uh, down and try to decrease um, uh, that population and its ability to spread in the future. And good news is we're finding um, two into three years post fire, um, we're still having these suppressive effects. And so one of the things we're excited about thinking about is can we um, use native perennials uh, post fire to be able to get long-term suppression of goat grass and Medusa head. Uh, we do see that post-fire, the native grasses re-sprout really quickly. And so uh, we're collaborating with uh, Paul Agner at McLaughlin Reserve, where we're putting in um, plots um, after, well, we put in plots after their 2020 um, fires of native uh, perennial grasses to see if those can suppress Medusa head and goat grass over the long-term. Because not only right, do we have this open land, but goat grass and Medusa head we know are decreased for two to three years. And so that's a good chance to get those uh, native perennials in without that late season competition. So just to sum up, um, Medusa head and goat grass have a lot of reasons why they're increasing, right? We see with nitrogen deposition, with late season rains and with peak uh, spring grazing, uh, they're spreading. Drier springs are really good at knocking them down. And so it's likely a time that's gonna be really effective uh, for control uh, over the long term. Same thing with burns, uh, particularly for Medusa head, right? It's virtually eliminated. Uh, goat grass is going to need, Chris mentioned, right? Burns plus some other thing for goat grass. Um, burns plus some other follow-up can be really important to um, decre uh, decreasing it further. And those native perennial grasses, once established, provide long-term suppression, um, even in those highly favorable years. So thank you so much. And I think Whitney's probably got some poll questions. Otherwise, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>